So as you're headed out, uh, you can head out and to the right. We are going to continue in our sermon series in the book of Hebrews. We've been in this, um, quick caveat before we start. Uh, so we just got a new computer and a new program and a new everything, and I've been playing with it this morning because that's the best time to learn about things for church is on Sunday morning, right? So a quick caveat, if things happen to go awry, it's live church, we just roll with it. We never pretend to be perfect. We, you know, we try really hard sometimes, I think, but uh, we're, we're still learning, and so it's going to be fun. Uh, we're continuing this sermon series in the book of Hebrews. We've been in it for the past six weeks now, uh, pretty much through most of this summer, and, and we're continuing in it today. So if you haven't been here, or maybe you missed uh, uh, a time or, or whatever, just a quick recap, uh, and, and maybe we can remember together. We began by talking about how Hebrews is a book that is written to Jewish converts to Christianity that are spread through the Roman Empire. So these are, these are folks that used to follow Judaism. They would be adherents to the Old Testament law, and, and participants uh, a lot of times in the Old Testament sacrificial rites and all the things that, that go on with that. But they have heard the message of Jesus and they have turned their lives towards him. They've turned their hearts towards him. Uh, but they're facing persecution and, and lots of it. Uh, the Roman Empire, uh, especially in the first century, was just repute with, uh, with persecution of Christians especially. And, and so um, the, the, Jewish, the Jewish converts, the, the, the Jewish Christians now, um, we're, we're facing this persecution considering going back to Judaism. So that was easier. Uh, it was more comfortable. You didn't face death so much, which is kind of nice in life, right? You're not being threatened to die all the time is a good thing, we like to think. Um, and so they were considering going back, backsliding, turning uh, back to, to Judaism. And, and the writer of Hebrews is writing to them saying, no, 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 no. Jesus is the real deal. He is the Messiah. Let me show you how he fulfills scripture. Hold on to your faith. Keep your eyes firmly focused on him. Hang in there. Don't turn back. And so that's what we've been talking about over the past six weeks. In Hebrews chapter 1, uh, the, the, the writer talks about how Jesus is God. right? That, that Jesus is the exact representation of God. The exact representation of God's being. And so Jesus is d divine. He is fully God. And yet Jesus was also human. Hebrews chapter 2 talks about how Jesus was fully human. He took on human life, human capacity, everything that makes us human. He took it on, except that he didn't sin. He was without sin. And because he was without sin, because he was both fully God and fully human, he was able to live a life that fulfilled the law. He was everything that the law described. The law was God's self-revelation. God's uh, revelation of his love uh, and, and how, what it means to live and love as God lives and loves. And naturally, humans, we're sinful, right? We mess up. How many people have messed up something this morning already? Oh, only half of you. That's awesome. All right, well, the, the day's young, right? Um, <laughs> right? We're humans. We mess things up and we can't live up to the standards of the law, but Jesus did. He fulfilled the law for us. He lived that life. And then in Hebrews chapter 4, he laid his life down for us. He offers through that sacrifice the forgiveness of sins and what Hebrews says, rest from our work. Which means that we no longer have to strive to make ourselves perfect. We no longer have to, to try to earn our way back to salvation. Trying to earn our, our way out of sin because we can't do it. We never will be able to do it. But Jesus did it for us. And offers us what, what, what Hebrews calls Sabbath rest. Rest from our works, the ability to lay down, uh, to, to lay down that desire to earn our way back to God and take it on grace when we believe in Him. And so Jesus, in doing all that, also fulfills another role in the Old Testament, uh, the role of priest. Now in the Old Testament, there were priests. They worked in the temple. They were a part of, of the sacrificial rite. They were the ones who were the mediators between God and and in humanity. Uh, they were intercessors for us. They would take the whatever was being sacrificed, they would do the sacrifice, and then they would mediate God's forgiveness to the people of God. But Jesus, Jesus fulfilling the law, takes on the role of priest. We call it the great high priest because he is the, the priest to end all priests. So we are, no other priests are needed. He is our mediator. He is our intercessor. He is our sacrifice. We don't need anyone else. And Jesus fulfills all of that takes that on himself. And, and so uh, 
the, this is kind of gets us into the second section, section of Hebrews where we're talking about Jesus as the great high priest, our mediator, our intercessor. And that's what we're talking about. Uh, we've talked about it for the last two weeks. We're going to talk about it today and uh, next week as well, I believe. Uh, and, and so uh, after Hebrews 5, the, uh, the author takes a little bit of a, uh, a rabbit trail. Um, he, he says, we want to talk more about this. But then he, he says, but you no longer try to understand. And he he enters into this, this conversation about how it's so important to be firmly rooted in the Scriptures to have a deep, deep relationship with Jesus Christ. Not because we have to, but because our hearts are called to, because we're hungry for it, because we have accepted Jesus. We want to grow in that relationship. We want to know Him more. We want to grow deeper, deeply rooted in our faith. So this is an important aspect of, of what he's talking about, that we need to go deeper. And that leads us into chapter 7 today, which is a deeper conversation about who Jesus is as the great high priest. So I invite you to open your scripture or your Bible uh, to Hebrews chapter 7. Um, if you don't have a Bible with you, you're welcome to use one of ours. They're located just underneath the seats in front of you there. Um, you can also follow along here on the screen. The words will be there as well. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 7. So we're going to talk about uh, a guy named Melchizedek. Um, you may or may not be familiar with this guy. Uh, he shows up once in the Old Testament. We're going to talk a lot about him today and, and the relationship that he has to Jesus. So um, let's read together. Listen for the word of the Lord. Uh, oh, and just a caveat to that. Uh, if, if you remember over the past two weeks, you've probably heard this name. Because the, the author says, he's a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And he doesn't say anything else about it. And then he says, and, and then he's a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And he doesn't say anything else about it. And now the writer is, is getting to what he means by that. He's kind of like, you know, hanging these words. It's like a teaser, right? Teaser to a movie. You get like the, the you know, two seconds or whatever. What is it? Two minutes of a, of a whole movie clip. And you're like, oh, what does that mean? This is so awesome. That's kind of what he's trying to do. Not quite the uh, cinematic thriller that we're used to maybe in our lives today, but that's what's going on here. Uh, he's been kind of teasing this now for a couple chapters. So, here's chapter 7. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham, returning from the defeat of the kings, and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Just think of how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi who become priests to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their fellow Israelites, even though they are also descended from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In one case, the tenth is collected by people who die. But in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still another, a still need for another priest to come? One in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed, the law must, al be al must be changed also. He of whom these things are said belonged to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, and in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears. One who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation, as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak 
and useless, for the law made nothing perfect. And a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God, and it was not without an oath. Others became priests without any oath, but he became priest with an oath when God said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office, but Jesus lives forever. He has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens, unlike the other high priests. He does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weakness. But the oath which came after the law appointed the Son, who has been made perfect forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So that's a lot. Huh? Yeah, did you follow all that? We're good? We can go home now? Yeah. <laughs> so, so chapter 7 is really deep. Remember in chapter 6 he said, we have a lot to say about this. That's the lot that he had to say about this. And, and there is a whole bunch there. Uh, but as we enter into chapter 7, there are a couple of assumptions that the author makes about his audience, about the people that he's talking to, right? The, 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 the assumptions are this. First, that the audience would be very familiar with the Old Testament. And, and second, that the, the, uh, the audience would recognize the story of Melchizedek, or at least the character, uh, that, that they would understand the Levitical priesthood, and that they would be familiar with the concept of tithing. All of those things are assumptions that go into this. So before we unpack this a little bit, let's talk real quickly. Actually, we'll unpack this and talk real quickly about these assumptions. It'll all ha kind of happen at the same time. First, that the, the, uh, the audience would be very familiar with the Old Testament. All of Hebrews is an interpretation of Jesus. It's interpreting Jesus in light of what we call the Old Testament. This was all the Jewish people had at the time. Uh, remember, so in the first century AD, m many of the letters in the Old Testament weren't even written until 50, 60, 70 AD or later a a with some of them. And so the, the scriptures that they had were essentially scrolls from the Old Testament. The scrolls from the prophets, scrolls from the Pentateuch. This is what their scriptures were. So when they came to worship on, you know, so it was Saturday, I guess it was, right? The, the, the Sabbath, when they came to worship, or when the Christians came to worship on Sundays, uh, that's what they had. They had some letters that were circulating, and maybe they happened to get one, and, and they, were, they were fortunate in that way. But otherwise, they were looking at the Old Testament and interpreting Jesus and salvation from the Old Testament. The Old Testament is really important. Um, think about, oh, oh, bummer, whatever. I thought, I, <laughs> uh, think, think about the story of Jesus in Luke chapter 4, right? Jesus goes to a synagogue in his hometown on the Sabbath, and, and what does he do? He sits down, and then he's handed a scroll from the book of Isaiah. So he stands up, he reads the, part of the scroll. Is, uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, freedom for the oppressed, uh, and da-da-da-da-da. He reads this whole thing, and then he rolls it up. He hands it back to the priest and says, well, that's fulfilled right now when you're he hearing. Like, I just fulfilled that. And then he sits down. You know, it's like, Jesus drops the mic and that's it. That, that part probably didn't happen so much, but the idea of, of reading from a scroll in the Old Testament and probably having a priest talk about that a little bit, talk about what that means, is something that would have happened all the time. Uh, they didn't have the New Testament. So the Old Testament is vitally important. But something else is, is important when we think about this too. It amplifies our need and amplifies the understanding uh, or the importance of our understanding the Old Testament. We have this temptation to throw the Old Testament away. It's confusing. Uh, it's boring in places. 
Um, the, the, God of the, the God of the Old Testament, same God, but when we, when we say this, right, the, the God of the Old Testament, the way that God acts in the Old Testament doesn't always fit with, with uh, how we see God in the New Testament, right? God is gracious, God is loving, uh, God redeems and he saves. Uh, but in, in the Old Testament, God sends his people to pretty much do ethnic cleansing in the land of Canaan. And we're like, uh, what? That, that doesn't seem to fit. It's, it's, it's hard to understand. We could talk about that sometime. That would be, that's actually be a really fun uh, sermon series too. Not because of ethnic cleansing, but because it's not ethnic cleansing actually. Um, <laughs> we don't like ethnic cleansing. Uh, but so this is, it can be confusing. There's, there's a lot of things in the Old Testament that, that kind of are a little bit weird. And as we've been saying in, in, in this book of Hebrews, right? Jesus is, oh come on, really? Jesus is what? Better? Yes? That was the beginning of the whole book of Hebrews. We talked about how Jesus is better. You say that with me. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Yeah. So we have this mindset that the Old Testament, eh, it's, eh, right? We got Jesus now and we don't need that anymore. But it's true that you don't need the Old Testament to meet Jesus. You don't. We can meet Jesus. We can hear the stories of the gospel. We can meet our Savior. But to really get to know him. To really get to know him. To, to grow deep in that relationship like we talked about last week. The Old Testament is vitally important. Biblical knowledge, you know, especially Old Testament knowledge, it shouldn't be ever a test of whether or not you belong here or belong in church in general. Right? You remember that story in the book of Judges? Did you study Judges this morning? Right? We, we shouldn't do that. But... When we come to Christ, when our hearts are changed, a hunger for the Scriptures, a hunger for getting to know Christ in a deeper way, it's an effect of that. We should want to know more about this. We should want to learn more about this as it grows and deepens our relationship and our understanding of who Jesus is and, and, and what he was called to do in the world. So the second thing, the, the second assumption that... that uh, the author has here is that uh, people would understand or recognize at least the story of Melchizedek. So Melchizedek is this really mysterious character. And if you haven't heard about him, don't kick yourself. Uh, most people probably haven't. He literally shows up one time at the beginning of the Old Testament in the book of Genesis. He's mentioned one time in the book of Psalms. And then he has more mentions in the book of Hebrews uh, than, than, than anything else. Like three times, four times the amount you know, when you only show up once, it's not a lot. But the, he, he's kind of this mysterious character. So let's, let's go to Hebrew, Genesis real quick. After Abraham returned from defeating uh, that king and the other kings that were allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shiva. That's the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. It's a bit of an illusion there. Bread, wine, bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. This is it. That's all we know about Melchizedek. Right? Really telling, huh? Uh, you know everything you need to know about him. Well, so there's a couple of things that are contained in this story. Melech in, in Hebrew means king. Uh, and it says this right here in, in Hebrews 7. Melech means king. Zedek is, is part of the word for righteousness. So uh, Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Uh, and he also is said to be the king of Salem. Uh, Salem is, is actually short for Jerusalem. Um, Jerusalem was occupied in this time. It wasn't Jerusalem that we know now. It wasn't Jerusalem that we know in the time of David. But it was an area in the land of Canaan that was occupied. And, and so he's the king of righteousness. He's also the king of peace, or king of Jerusalem, Salem. Uh, and, and these are intentional names that get drawn forward. He's the priest of God Most High. Melchizedek is a sort of symbolic figure. Right? Scripture says he doesn't have a mother, he doesn't have a father, he doesn't have a beginning, and he doesn't have an end. And we say, well, hold up a second. I don't know a lot about everything, but I happen to know that this dude was human, that he had a mother, and he had a father, and that means he had a beginning, and he definitely has an end, because we're human, right? 
the, the death rate in, in humanity right now is hovering right around 100%. And that's just how life is. We live and we, we get old and we die. That's just the way it is. So, uh, but what's going on here? Well, because, because in, in, these, in these days, because Scripture didn't say anything about where he came from or where he went, they, they make this sort of argument from silence, it's called. It's a rhetorical idea that you can kind of use him as a symbol to say, look at, look at, he is, he's kind of an eternal figure. He shows up. Everybody else in the Old Testament died. Even, you know, you got Abraham, these, these great patriarchs, he died. Uh, Isaac, Jacob, they all died. Every one of them died, except for, for some reason Melchizedek. They don't mention anything about him dying. Uh, and, and so they, they, they kind of make this analogy that this figure, Melchizedek, resembles Christ. He's the priest of God Most High, a priest of God before there was ever a Levitical priesthood. And so he's different somehow. Not quite sure how. It's a little mysterious, but he's different. And Scripture points out the differences and, and talks about them and then pulls them forward and relates them to Christ. And part of this has to do with our understanding of Levitical priesthood, right? So the Levites were a tribe of Israel. They were called to be priests in, in the in the like in the nation of Israel. They didn't get an inheritance of land. When they moved into Canaan, every tribe got land except for the Levites. Poor guys. Except that they were the priests and they could go into the temple and things like that. So, ha, right? That's what they get. And, and, and they also get a tenth of everything. Uh, this, this tenth was given to them. We'll get to that in a second. But that was, that was part of what sustained them. They didn't have jobs. They didn't grow crops. They didn't have animals, whatever. They they were the priests. They were the ones that served God. They were the, the intercessors, the mediators, and all of that. But this was a familial thing. right? There was nothing special about the priests except that they got born into this. That's just what happened. If you were born in the tribe of Levi, you became a priest. It was pretty much what you did. Um, and so this is all that, that we have about, uh, about the priesthood. Uh, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, how the priests were mediators. We talked about how they were intercessors and, and what they did as far as the worship and the sacrifices. But there's another thing that comes out in this passage that is important. And I think it's important for us because we sometimes fall into this trap a little bit too. The priests carried out the law and the sacrificial rites and they kind of got it into their heads that if they kept doing this and they kept following the law and they kept sacrificing all these animals, that eventually God would make them perfect. And if they just tried hard enough and they worked really hard and they just kept on doing it, eventually God would make them perfect. And when God made them perfect, then he would make the rest of Israel perfect. And when he made the rest of Israel perfect, he would make the world perfect. That's how God was going to bring back Eden in the world. That he was going to use these humans, these, these Levites, the priests, to do that. And they had to work really hard to make that happen. This is why, if you remember the fact that the, the people of Israel go into exile, this is why that's so devastating. Because the priests couldn't do what they thought they had to do to make things perfect. Because they were taken away from the temple that was destroyed, and they could no longer offer the sacrifices the way the law told them to. It was devastating to them. Because they tried and 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 tried and tried and, tried and then pff, they're completely wiped out and they can't do what they feel God's calling them to do. But what they missed, what they missed in all this is that God was actually using them to point forward and that perfection was never a possibility for them. We see this later in the book of Jeremiah. Right? In those days and at that time I will make a righteous branch, branch sprout from David's line. Different tribe. David was from the tribe of Judah. I will make a, a branch sprout from David's line and he will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved. Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called. Our Lord, our righteous Savior. It's a prophecy of the coming Messiah who will be like a priest but not like the priests. You hear that distinction? He will be a priest, but he will not be like the priests. Something's different. God's doing a new thing. In, in, in the, in the uh, prophets all the time, we hear God saying, see, there's this old thing, and you're not listening to me, and you're not doing this, and so I'm going to do this new thing. 
And that new thing is Jesus, the Messiah. He's coming. And He's going to fulfill all of the things that you can't fulfill. And that's what, that's what all of chapter 7 here is getting at. That Jesus is, is different. You know, He's the great high priest, but not like the other priests. He has a completely different line. His priesthood is eternal. It's different. And it actually is effective. It's just kind of important. So the other thing, and this is kind of a, maybe a little tangential, but a, a, a tangent, but it is also important, is that the idea, the, the, the audience would have an understanding of, or be familiar with the concept of tithing. So tithing gets a pretty bad rap, especially nowadays, right? You have to give to the church because that's what you have to do, because that's what the Bible says. Well, let's, quick, quick history of tithing. Uh, we go all the way back to Genesis 4, right? You have Cain and you have Abel. Remember this story? Who remembers this story? Are you still with me? This is a lot, I know, right? So Cain and Abel, right? Cain brings, uh, Cain brings uh, some of his um, kind of, you know, haphazard, not quite so good things, and he brings them to sacrifice, probably because he doesn't, uh, he doesn't want them, they're not that good. And then Abel brings, you know, the first fruits. He brings the best of the best. And what happens? God likes Abel's the best, Right? And, and, and so we have this initial idea of when we bring things to God, we do it because our heart's in it, not because we have to. That's part of it. That's the very beginning of what we see when we talk about giving back to God. And then you have Abraham, right? Abraham experiences this great victory. I don't know everything about what happened in this, in this Old Testament passage, but I don't think he was expected to win, right? It's like when... When Michigan plays anybody, we just don't expect them to win anymore, right? I'm just kidding. Come on, let's laugh a little bit. No, it's like, you know, the, when, when the underdog goes in, right? When the underdog goes in and everybody's like, they are so not going to win this. And, and then they do. Everybody celebrates because it's this major awesome thing. It's really awesome. That's actually Michigan State now. I get it. I know, I know, I know, right? So, um... Abraham's not expected to win. So he wins. He becomes insanely wealthy off of this because of all the plunder that he gets from this war. And he goes back and he meets this Melchizedek guy. And Melchizedek blesses him, offers a blessing. And then Abraham gives a tenth of everything to him. Now, I don't know this for sure, but I don't think Abraham actually knew Melchizedek. We don't get any sort of idea that Abraham would have been familiar with him. That, that this dude, Melchizedek just comes out and meets him Abraham's not even really living in that area too much. Uh, and, and so, but, but he has this encounter with God. And then he gives a tenth of everything that he has. Now, that's not an arbitrary number. He wasn't thinking in his head like, eh, 20% is probably too much. 5% sounds a little skimpy. How about 10%? It was kind of a normal thing back in those days. 10% was kind of a normal religious thing to do. And so Abraham does the normal religious thing out of the, the thing that's going on in his heart. He's blessed, he has an encounter with God, and he gives in response to that. Later on, we have Jacob. Jacob uh, runs away from Esau, and you remember he lays down, he uses the rock for his pillow, and he has this vision. Remember the vision? The angels are coming down, up and down from heaven on the staircase, and God says, I'm going to make my covenant with you. You're the, you're the next guy now. Um, you know, it's Abraham, there's Isaac, now it's you, you're Jacob, and you're going to be, uh, you're gonna be the, the, the person. And so uh, Jacob says, he wakes up, he says, God, if you protect me, I'm going to give a tenth of everything I have to you. Same thing. God, Jacob meets God, he has an encounter with God, he gives back out of the, the goodness, out of the, the change that goes on in his heart. The same is true in Exodus 35. They're trying to build the tabernacle. The tabernacle, after the law has been given, they've encountered God, uh, they're, they're, they're trying to build the tabernacle. Uh, an ask goes out. Hey, we need materials. And the people give. They give wildly generously uh, because, uh, because they, uh, they are working to create a place where God is going to be present. It's, it's, it's really awesome how, how all of this comes together. And then, so after all of that, then we have the Levitical law that says, hey, y'all got to give a tenth to the Levites because they're priests and they don't have jobs. <laughs> kind of feels like what, you know, I'm saying right now, right? Hey, 
I don't actually have a job. I'm a pastor. So, uh, no, just kidding. Right? But that's what, that's what happens. This idea of tithing, this idea of tithing doesn't come out of a law that says you have to give. It says you've encountered God and a heart change takes place and then people give because of that. And really, honestly, it's not about the money. It's about the response. It's about the response that goes on when we encounter God. Now, all that to say, when we encounter God, and if you have Jesus in your heart, and if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've encountered God. And so the idea of tithing or giving or whatever is a response to the grace, the salvation, the blessing that God continually pours out on our lives as well. It's not about money. It's about response. It's about obedience. It's about discipleship, a part of our growing and trusting in God day in and day out. Okay, so now we read this big long passage that has a lot in it, and now we've talked about a whole bunch of things that have a lot in them. So what? Right? Your knowledge base is a little bit deeper than it was when you came in here this morning. If you had the coffee that I started late, and it's probably slightly weaker than normal, uh, and you're not asleep, right? That's, that's what's going on so far? Yeah, okay, good. So what, right? So what? We, we, so we read scripture and we talked a little bit about some information. So what? All of this points to Jesus. Perhaps that goes without saying, but that is really what is going on here. As as the writer has been doing and continues to do in Hebrews. He's making a case for who Jesus is and how Jesus is different and how that difference has an impact on our lives. Right? Melchizedek points to Christ. Melchizedek is the king of righteousness and the king of peace. Well, who's Jesus? The king of, sorry, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the righteous son of God, the prince of peace. We can go on and give them more and more names, but all of those names are drawn forward in the Old Testament and used to talk about the coming Messiah. Melchizedek doesn't have an ending in the Old Testament. Jesus legitimately has no end. He is the priest forever. He is eternally at the right hand of God. Remember uh, two weeks ago we talked about Jesus as the great high priest and how Jesus who understands completely what it is to be human. So he understands every weakness, every issue, every temptation, every falter that we experience. And he can mediate that before God. He can intercede before God. When we come to Jesus and say, I am, I am struggling with lust because... I." I, I just, I, I can't help it. Jesus says, okay, I, I can understand that. I've been human. I know that. He can mediate God's forgiveness, God's grace, God's love, perhaps God's encouragement to continue on, to not get down on ourselves. Whatever it is, this is who Jesus is. And Jesus is at the right hand of God. Remember two weeks ago we talked about how we don't have to shout across some wide gulf to try to, or some, some wide chasm to try to get God's attention. We don't have to do that because Jesus is right there. And he is right here with us too. That Jesus sends the Holy Spirit and because of the Holy Spirit, we are connected to Christ. We are made one with him. He hears us. He's with us each and every day. And his righteousness, the righteous Son of God, the king of righteousness, is put on us so that when God looks at us, he sees his son. And the peace of Christ is in us. It's a part of us because we are a part of him. Jesus is that great high priest. He is that mediator. The end of Hebrews 7, it says, right? Now there have been many priests, or uh, there have been many priests, many of those priests since death have prevented them from continuing in office, but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save us completely. Completely. 
not partially, not a little bit at a time, when we come to Jesus, the great high priest, the one who offers himself as a sacrifice, we are saved completely from the very first second. No more having to earn it ourselves. No more having to to make our own way. Jesus saves us completely. Are you feeling what I'm saying right now? You know every aspect about who you are, right? How, How many people have something in their life right now that they've never told anyone ever? Really? No one? Okay. Right? There are things inside of you. You don't want to say it because you're embarrassed. You don't want to say it because, because you, you feel condemned by it. Whatever. It holds you back. Right? Jesus has redeemed that already. God knows it. And he has redeemed it. The deepest, darkest parts of who we are are already seeing and experiencing the light. Now, there's an act of participation on our part where we have to give those things to God and we have to participate as, as, as those things are worked out in us because God doesn't want us to hold on to those things. He doesn't want us to be bound by those things because we don't have to be. We are saved completely by him. And because he is that high priest, Scripture says, he truly meets all our needs. All our needs. <laughs> so, we learn that uh, as, as parents, <laughs> that, that our needs change, right? Last night, we got like, what, two hours of sleep? Three hours of sleep, maybe? Is that, is that what happened? I don't, I don't even remember. Like, it was just, right? You learn that your needs change. That pretty, I think it pretty much happens throughout your entire life. Right? As your kids get older, your needs change. As your kids, your kids' needs change and all these things, right? That, that all throughout our life, right? Our, we're, we're navigating this thing we call life and, and sometimes we don't even know what our needs are. But Jesus does. And not only does he know them, he meets them. He meets them before we even know what they are. God continues to sustain us to provide for us, to walk along with us, to mediate forgiveness, love, grace, mercy to us from God, sometimes before we even know what that means for us. This is who Jesus is. This is what Jesus does as the great high priest. And it impacts every aspect of who we are, if we let it. We have to accept it We have to participate in it as the the Spirit is working out in us that salvation, that redemption, that what we call sanctification or or what what, what we describe as kind of being remade in the image of Christ. God sees an image of, of Christ on us, but we are constantly being worked on to live into that image. Are we participating in that? Scripture talks about Melchizedek being greater than Abraham. Right? That Abraham, the, the, so in, in the end of chapter 6, uh, we were talking about Abraham as being the example of faith. That, that's, that's what the, the author was kind of drawing us to. Hey, you need to deepen your faith. It's, it, it's dangerous when, when you kind of just rest on the whole idea of spiritual infancy and da-da-da-da-da. Look to Abraham. You see what Abraham does. And, and, and it casts Abraham as this great hero of faith. And then in the next chapter, here's Melchizedek, and Abraham gives a tenth of everything he owns to Melchizedek. So Abraham's this great guy, but Melchizedek is greater. Well, Melchizedek is great, but Jesus is the greatest. Jesus is the ultimate example, the ultimate priest, the ultimate intercessor. He is the one who is with us. He is the one who is for us. Eternally and forever. So what are we going to do with that? The implication that is found throughout all of this. The continual urging of the author. Don't turn back. 
hold on to your faith. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Move forward. Don't fear. God is faithful. All of these things are found in here. How are we going to respond to this? Are we going to respond by showing up at church and sitting in the seats every Sunday? Or are we going to respond with our whole self, our whole lives? It talks about giving, about the tithing thing. And it's really, it's really about response. Right? Tithing is important. So is so are devotion. So is prayer life. So, I mean, all these things, right? We can get into the sort of legalistic idea of what those things mean, but it's not about that at the end of the day. It's about what's going on in here. And that is so much more difficult sometimes because it's not black and white, because it's, it's kind of gray. But like last week where the author is saying, hey, dig deeper, be rooted. Again, again, he's saying, you see what Abraham did? You see the response that took place there? That needs to be a part of who we are too. So last week, Last week, I, the Scripture challenged us. And I kind of explained that challenge in this way. I don't know where you are in your prayer life. I don't know where you are in your devotional life. Right? We can talk about tithing this way. I don't know where you are uh, as far as tithing is concerned. But what would it look like? I and mean, we can talk about this in any aspect of, of the Christian walk and the Christian faith. I don't know where you are. And I think our tendency is to hear things like, hey, we need to grow deeper, and we try to do them all at once, right? Yeah, that, that, that's, and that's, that's all nice, but it's like the, we talked about last week, the New Year's resolutions. I made them on January 1. I made them on December 31, and I'd broken them by January 2. Right? What, what, what would it take to take one step? So maybe last week we said, you know, maybe, maybe you can go through an entire week and you never crack the Bible. What would it look like to just open the Bible once? Read something, meditate on it for a few minutes. What would it look like to do that in your life? What kind of an impact would it have? What would it look like to take the next step this week? If last week was once, this week is twice. What would it look like to spend a few minutes more in prayer this week? What would it look like to respond in obedience in just a little bit greater way and see the love of God, the Holy Spirit at work changing and transforming us as we follow our great high priest and as we lean on him, we trust in him and experience the love of God. What would it look like? I hope you find out. Let's pray. Lord, your challenges for us are great. But Lord, you don't send us alone. You challenge us and walk with us each and every day. Lord, this morning we pray that, that the challenge of your word would not fall on deaf ears. But Lord, as we look uh, to Scripture, as we see the responses of your people throughout time, uh, that, that throughout the, the past, Lord, that, that you would instill in us too a, a, a heart change, Lord, a, a deep hunger to follow you in deeper ways. To be more obedient and to experience your grace, your freedom that much more. Lord, help us Lord, to be uncomfortable. Challenge us, Lord. Make us uneasy so that we can find, Lord, our rest in you. Not because we have to, but because we long to. Because we want more of you. Thank you for Jesus, for your grace, for your love. Help us to experience it 
greater and greater each day. In Jesus' name, amen. As we respond to what we've heard today, and as we go from this place, we're going to sing uh, two songs. The first one, and I think they fit perfectly with where we are. The first one is, is First Love. We've been singing this song a lot lately. Um, we, we started singing this when we were talking about the book of Revelation. Um, what does it look like in our lives for Jesus to be our first love? To not get the, the crumbs at the end of the day, but to, to first love, to be the one who, who's on our minds when we wake up in the morning, rather than the cell phone that we probably pick up right off the night. Guilty, right? What does that look like for us? And we're going to pause a moment for a blessing. And then we're going to sing Christ is Enough. It's a proclamation that in all of our lives, everything that we have, all of that, that Jesus Christ is enough. We don't need, we don't need fulfillment from other things because we have it in Christ. Let's stand as we sing.